and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, for he is our health and our salvation. We serve an awesome God. Would you stand as we proclaim that to the world this day? Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Good morning, First Baptist Church. So good to see you. Good morning. Uh, as we gather today, may we come into God's presence. And I hope that you think about your expectations today. If you're expecting to receive the word of the Lord, dig deep in his word. If you expect to experience him in praise, praise him with all your heart. If you expect a miracle, pray along with us and pray unceasingly. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can come into this place for this hour makes all the difference in the world. And yet we are reminded that worship is not just an hour, but a lifestyle in which we come to celebrate you together to tell stories and the great story of where we have experienced you this past week and anticipate where we might experience you and meet you this week ahead. But for right now, Lord, as you show up today, transform us, change us, and move us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior. The hope of
Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I
changed my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, O oh Morning, church family. It's good to be together again another mor Sunday morning in his house. This morning, as we uh, look to have a time of prayer, we remember uh, Myrtle Holman's husband, uh, Bump, passed away. And uh, so today, this afternoon at Strunk, we'll be having visitation. Pastor Joe will be, uh, has been asked to, to oversee this. So, visitation this afternoon from 2 to 4, and then the service will be on Monday morning at 10. So that's for Bump Holman, Myrtle Holman's husband. So please remember him. If you, if you know the Holmans, please uh, send out a letter, card, a phone call to, uh, to encourage and comfort them in this time of loss. Also today, later this morning, we'll be recognizing and honoring our own Ronnie Self, who uh, has already gone into retirement. So bring him by and uh, if you have a minute uh, to come by later after the second service, and we're going to do a drive-by, so you can bring a pie to give or to throw on his face. Just kidding. To give him and uh, to honor him for all of his years of uh, service here at First Baptist. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly gracious Father, we come to you this morning expectant to hear from you and your word, expectant to be cleansed. To me, may new. Lord, we come broken in a broken world, but you've clothed us with the righteousness of Christ. So let us rejoice. Let us be bold in sharing this newness of life with those around us, those in the world we come into contact with, both here in Vero Beach and as we travel throughout this state, throughout this country, throughout this world being your ambassadors of this good news. Let's see people turn from death to life, and we will praise you for it. Lord, continue to be in the midst of us this morning. Draw us closer to yourself by praising you and worshiping you in spirit and truth. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. <laughs>
I remember my days of darkness Without sunshine or light to lead the way And the sound of his voice softly calling to the arms of my maker I'll stay He is my reason for living He is the king of all kings I long to be his possession After the thunder and lightning After the last bell has rung I will bow down before him And hear him say, job well done He is my reason for living He is the king of all kings I long to be his possession As he is my everything I long to be his possession Yeah, he is my everything Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, still in chapter 1, verses 21 through 34. Mark 1, 21 through 34. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and, and raised her up, making her, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. When a evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door, and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. He was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Michael and worship team for worship, and Glenn, thank you for that beautiful song. It's amazing. Whenever you hit that first note, it's always a wow for me. You know, whenever you hit that first note, 
you know, and you think, uh, I haven't heard this song before, I don't think. So when you belted it out, I thought, wow, <laughs> thank you for that blessing. Sometimes we lose our way. Uh, I make it a, a practice, uh, try to do it daily, to go to the beach and walk the beach for exercise. And it's amazing how many footprints are in the, the sand whenever I walk and I try to figure out where to step. And when it comes to this time and this place, I want to walk in Jesus' shoes. I want to walk where he walks. And during this time, we as a church want to walk where he walks. And so we want to set our compasses, our direction, to true north to seek out what his will is for us, for our church, not just First Baptist Church, but his church globally around the world in this community. We've been talking about the sermon series of what it means to be Christ's church because it's important to remember who we are and whose we are. And so we've made a home in the Gospel of Mark, that gospel that gives us pictures and snapshots of what it means to be Christ's church. Baptized believers there on the scene with the very first, uh, very first part of Jesus' ministry of getting baptized and then gathering and calling disciples to gather around him as baptized believers to hear Christ's call and to follow him, not to follow some fad or some agenda, but to hear Jesus say, follow me and I will make you fishes of men. Taking our skills and our background and all of who we are to put it at work in this time and place. I want to remind you that the gospel begins with a very specific tone, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. It's actually a militaristic tone. I want to remind you what I've been saying over and over again, that gospel, good news, was a very specific message that came off of the battlefield in the ancient world. If a king was victorious, the messengers would come and bring gospel, a good news of victory that they were successful on the battlefield. It's a very specific militaristic posture that Mark takes because Jesus is one who's not gonna stand around and contemplate things or calculate things. He moves from place to place. You'll see how many times that word immediately comes up within the text. And there, Jesus continues to move and show us now today and gives us a picture of what the good news looks like. For many of us who have cut our teeth in Baptist life, Whenever we hear the word gospel, we think of it primarily as an invitation, a message of salvation in Christ. But when we look at Mark's understanding of gospel good news, there's so much more than a simple invitation. There's so much more than just declaring Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life. The good news, the gospel, Jesus' victory is transformative to our whole life. And the gospel message is so much larger than the mere words that we speak God's victory in Jesus Christ comes in a powerful, life-transforming, community-transforming way. Now, you might be surprised that in our third week in the gospel, we're still in chapter 1. That's how jam-packed and action-packed the gospel of Mark is. Now, you may think, are we going to spend this much time in Mark? Probably not. I mean, we'll skip around. But you have to understand these pictures of what it means to be Christ's church to understand what it means to bear the victory of God, the good news, the gospel of God. And the picture we get today is the impact of that victory. We see here the picture of the spiritual battle that is taking place around the victory of God, Jesus Christ. And there is nothing short than a clash between Jesus and evil, Jesus and disease or disease. And I say disease for a reason, because not all of us have a disease, but many of us have a heart that is at dis-ease or dis-ease. And Jesus' victory in which he overpowers that evil, overpowers the demonic forces, and brings healing and wholeness as a part, not separate from, but as a part, a critical part of God's victory, of gospel, of good news, and, and the kingdom of God that is unfolding in Jesus' um, midst. You can hear it in the voice of the demons. What do you have to do with us, Jesus? Are you coming to destroy us? Yes. Not only does he silence them, but he casts them out. Jesus' announcement of good news is one that silences evil and casts it out. It's not enough to just say, we'll pray for you, brother. We'll pray for you, sister. Because our prayers must be one that silences evil and not just silences it, but casts it out. 
Now, this is a stumbling block for today's church. I have a feeling that many churches, much like ours, struggle with growth and struggle with attracting people because we have fallen over the stumbling blocks of what it means to be Christ's church. For many churches and many Christians, we too often downplay spiritual warfare and we downplay evil. We forget that evil is among us. We forget that there is a real battle taking place, that spiritual warfare is indeed real. All you have to do is read Revelation, in which God un, uh, like a, takes a big zipper in reality and opens up the curtains so that John can see the spiritual battle taking place for the hearts of men and women and kingdoms and nations and institutions. You can go to the prophets in which Elijah and Elisha came forth to lead God's people into battle where God's people saw the Assyrians as far as the eye could see, the Assyrian horses and chariots and armies as far as the eye can see. But as soon as Elijah and Elisha cast a vision, their scripture tells us Israel's eyes were open to the heavenly realities in which there were chariots of fire surrounding the Assyrian army. There is a battle taking place for the hearts and minds of people today. We forget that spiritual warfare is real. You might recall the old uh, fiction book uh, by C.S. Lewis, The Screwtape Letters, in which a senior demon is writing to a, an up-and-coming demon, coaching and mentoring him on how to uh, inflict harm on Christ's church. And one of the things that the demon writes to his uh, mentoree is, is that people accuse demons of filling our heads with, with evil. And what the demon goes on to say in this fictional picture of evil is that it's the job of Satan, it's the job of the demon to remove things from your head. It's another way of saying to forget that there is a spiritual battle taking place. Another reason why we don't take this seriously is because sometimes we psychologize things. We could read the Bible and, and perhaps look at many of these stories of demonic possession and say maybe there was a mental health issue and that might be the case. But spiritual warfare is not just about mental health. It's not just a psychological or psychosis. Spiritual warfare is real if you've ever spent time with non-believers. You can sense a heaviness. If you've ever spent time for a, uh, for a length of time around those who don't cry, call Christ Lord, it's, you can cut it like a knife, the darkness, the lostness, the, the hostage that people are captive to. Another thing that is a stumbling block for us is that, at the end of the day, many of us still doubt miracles. We believe, well, you know, those, those miracles were for the biblical time. That doesn't happen anymore. And we start to explain things away. Well, it's just coincidence. Or, well, you know, I mean, I'm glad the doctors came through for that patient. He must have just gotten better. People are resilient. They get better. No. We, be, we have begun to doubt the miracles of God. And because of that, Christ's church has faltered and failed so many people in so many communities in our day and age. This sermon today is an indictment against what we have failed to do in delivering the complete and whole good news gospel of Christ. And so we no longer, like Jesus, astound, verse 22. We no longer spread Jesus' fame, verse 28. And we no longer lead people to Jesus, verse 32. Remembering what it means to be Christ's church means remembering why we exist so that we do not fall into utter irrelevancy. The good news of the gospel of Christ makes a difference. It makes a difference in the lives of people. Just as Jesus said in John 14, 12, you see these works that I have done, you who believe in me will do even greater works. And I want to test you and challenge you, church, where are those greater works in our midst? The healings, the casting out of evil in our midst, bringing healing and wholeness to community. Where are we at work in the world? Do we believe it? And are we relevant? Years and years ago, actually over, over years, and I don't know where this originated, I couldn't find the original notes, our church had a, a mantra, a slogan that really sh shaped who we are today. There was, a, and, and again, it might have come up in the 50s, maybe it came up with Doug Watterson in the 60s, but one of the mottos of our church has always been, in business for the Lord, downtown. I was sharing some about the history. I've been, I've been studying the history of the church, as you know, and I've been sharing this with Charlotte Self. And as soon as I said that, Charlotte Self went into her home and got me these pictures that she had from the 75th 
anniversary of, of, the, uh, of the church, and she showed me a cake, multi-level level cake that, that she made. And on that cake, she had did, did with the, uh, the icing, in business for the Lord, downtown. We've always been a church in business for the Lord, downtown. But what does it mean to be in business? What business are we about? Just as the demons asked Jesus, what is your business with us? And so we ask today, what is the business that we are engaged in in downtown? And Jesus gives us a picture, a snapshot of what the church's business is in declaring good news of God's victory in Jesus Christ. For one, like Jesus, we have to reclaim and believe that our message, the good news, not just the message we speak, but the life-transforming gospel that we proclaim in Christ has authority. You'll notice throughout this story and throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus continually speaks with authority. The scribes and the high pri the priests say here, who is this who comes with authority? Another word for authority is power. You'll see later in Mark 4, Jesus calms the storms. And the disciple says, who is this who can calm the storms with authority? When we follow in Jesus' footsteps, we are to proclaim the gospel, the life-transforming gospel, with authority. To communicate that God's victory in Jesus is final, once and for all. Not as the scribes. You'll notice uh, the, the priests say, who is this who speaks with authority? He speaks not as one of the scribes. Well, what did the scribes do? They debated. They wrestled. They went back and forth as to what they believed and what God was up to. With Jesus, there is no debate. His voice is authoritative. He does not enter into debates like authority. Uh, growing up, you know, with a household, uh, one of my children, I'm not going to say any names, uh, likes, to, likes to debate. And this child of mine likes to hook me into debates. And before you know it, a simple request to brush teeth or to get into pajamas or to get to bed is a five-minute long debate. He hooks me. Oh, I mean, my child hooks me. I mean, snags me every time. And Christina comes in, right, because we're debating, and she says, why are you debating your child? You are the adult. And I think, I don't know, he just roped me into it. <laughs> With Jesus, there is no debate. He is not like one of the scribes who tries to figure things out. With him, he, his words have power, and if we walk in the footsteps of Jesus, we are to bring an authoritative word of power. A word of power that astounds people, that makes a difference. We need to do this in the public sphere. And we have to re remember and reclaim that we are not just one voice among other voices in the marketplace. We are Jesus' voice in the marketplace. We proclaim a king who stands above every other name. He is not one name among other names. He is the name above all names. And our message of the gospel ought to be the authoritative voice that sounds like no other voice in the marketplace today. Christianity and our faith is not another idea, another idea to consume. It is a life-changing movement of God's victory in Jesus Christ. We also need to bring this word of authority in prayer. John 14, 14 says, ask for anything in my name, and it will, it will come to pass. When did we stop praying for miracles? for evil to be cast out. And I have a feeling that many of us are too afraid to pray because maybe we've been hurt too many times or we're anxious or, or uncertain about what God will bring. Jesus says, when you speak in my name, you speak with power and authority and whatever you ask will come to pass in my will. Our voice has to be one of authority. What happened to the church that started the abolitionist movement? that started the civil rights movement? Where is the voice that led the way on reforming child labor laws in the early 1920s, or who led reconciliation efforts in South Africa, who transformed entire communities in places like India and China and the Middle East? Where is that voice, and why is it that the culture has silenced us when we are in the business of following Jesus and silencing the demonic forces out there? At what point did the culture get in the business of silencing us rather than silencing it? But we've let our voice become just another voice in the marketplace. Rather than siding with Jesus, we've taken up too much sound bites and partisan politics. 
Rather than cutting a path for, path for peacemaking, we have sided with war and violence. Rather than, than following in the footsteps of those voices that have become before us, we've tried to establish status quo. Do you know that as late as the 1990s, late 80s, early 1990s, Christian, Christian private colleges were still banning students from dating and marrying across racial lines? As late as 1980s, early 1990s, Bob Jones University had in their books a policy that a white person could not date on campus or marry a black person. As late as the 80s and 90s. I'm not talking about the 1880s. Private colleges, our churches have become bastions of status quo rather than a voice of authority. I'm sorry to tell you the truth, church. But I have a feeling that a lot of our seats are empty in this church and elsewhere because our voice sounds way too much like the voice of culture. We have walked away from sounding like Jesus. If our voice is to have any power at all, it needs to sound like Jesus. It needs to astound. It needs to surprise. It needs to be authoritative and decisive. And it needs to declare the victory of God. We do not put power behind our prayers, and we have lost our authority in our voice because we sound just like everyone else. So being in business in downtown first requires some courage. <clears throat> we used to call it moxie in the day. Some courage, some authority, in which we reclaim the voice of sounding like Jesus rather than the culture around us. Another thing that we learn about being in business for God is that in declaring good news, we need to remember that the gospel contains within it the seeds of restoration, healing, exorcism, and wholeness, casting out evil, silencing evil. We have to remember that spiritual warfare is real. Evil powers wield over not only people, but institutions. You remember the wilderness experience when Jesus went to the wilderness to be tested? One of the temptations of Christ was that Satan brought him on the pinnacle uh, on, a, on a mountaintop and showed him all the world. And Satan said, I have the keys to these kingdoms. And if you worship me, I will give you the keys to these kingdoms. Demonic powers wield power over individuals and institutions. People are held hostage to darkness. We have to remember that the church's temptation is to worship other things, to wield the power of that, those keys, but we, and, but we need to remember and remember our place that we are on the side of Jesus, silencing and casting out evil for Satan and the demons around us. The church has always had an authoritative voice that brings with it restoration. I mentioned a few in which we've brought restoration to places of prejudice, places of exploitation in the public square. But you'll notice that healing also comes into the home. After Jesus exercises the demons, by the way, you notice where, the, where Jesus exercises the first demon? Where are they? They're at church. You notice that? They're in the synagogue. So it starts with the church in which we cast out evil. It starts, and then it moves, in, the, in this story at least, not necessarily in this order, in our life, but it moves in the home. Peter and the disciples bring Jesus home, and there, uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law has a fever, and Jesus touches the mother, and the fever leaves her. And there, there's an interesting thing, because it says she got up and she started to serve the disciples, which is kind of weird, you know? Like, Mom, rest. You know, you've had a fever. Let me serve you. But it's interesting, because the, the healing restores her to wholeness so that she might serve. And uh, though it's a, a bit of a kind of a classic story, you know, of domestic, you know, the domestic... Um, kind of role of the women back then, it is ultimately a story in which somebody is healed, brought up, and brought to wholeness. Restoration happens in the public square in which we push, we silence evil, and we cast it out. It comes home, and it comes into our very life. Where in your home do you need to bring healing and wholeness? What addictions do you need to silence and cast out? What abuses do you need to bring to bear prayer to wage spiritual warfare? What toxic patterns in your life? In your relationships, are you being held hostage to forces that are outside of Jesus' will for your life? And where do you need to bring healing and victory in the public square, in the home, and in your life? When we bring Jesus into the public square and into the home, with a voice of authority and with a healing ministry in Jesus' name, 
lives are changed. People are attracted to Jesus. And evil is silenced and cast out. If you go to Mark 2 sometime today, you'll notice the story of the paralyzed, the paralytic, in which friends drop a paralytic in the midst of Jesus. You remember that story? Jesus is teaching in the home. The place is crowded. There's a paralyzed man that the friends come and bring the paralyzed man. There's no way to get through, so they go through the roof. You remember? They lower the guy through the roof. Jesus forgives the guy's sin. Jesus heals him. It's interesting because the scribes say, um, how did you heal this guy? And Jesus says, well, what's easier, forgiving sins or healing people? And he does both. He says, I forgive you. Take up your mat and walk. There's this healing event. And Mark 2, 12 lets us know what it's like to bring God's victory to bear in the public sphere and in, in our home. Mark 2, 12 says uh, that the people who see this, uh, this miracle say this, we have never seen anything like this before. We have never seen anything like this before. In being about the business for the Lord downtown, we need to remember the power of the gospel, the fullness of the gospel. It's not enough to just tell people about Jesus and invite them to, to life in Christ. That is important. You, we have to do things in order to bring people healing and wholeness to go the extra step to show the power of the gospel in Jesus' life, to demonstrate the victory of God, and to bring people to Jesus himself. We need to remember the power. This requires that we're not to be offensive, but to go on the offensive in the public sphere, in prayer, and in our homes, to bring Jesus and his victory to bear around us, and to remember what it means to be Christ's church. It is true, we live in an age of science, and we explain a lot away, but even in the age of science, the church needs to reclaim the power and demonstrate the power of God's miraculous presence. In a technological age that creates tribes in which people run to and factions where people can stay in their home and, and share their opinions online, we need, to, we need to bring Jesus home and bring, make Jesus real to people. You'll notice Jesus touched Peter's mother-in-law in the home. We need to break out of the technology and enter into the lives of others to give an experience in which we touch them and bring healing to bear on their life. In a consumer age where there's so many people looking to better themselves in a fractured time, we need to bring the message of wholeness in which we help people understand the demonic forces in their life recognize their dis-ease and bring wholeness to free people from the hostage takeover of Satan and his minions. In a skeptical age where everything is questioned, we need to bring an authoritative of hope, faith, and love, declaring that there is no name above Jesus and that at his call, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. If we wait for people to come to the church, we'll, to grow the church, we will be waiting a long time. The message today is to bring the gospel news and to be in business for the Lord downtown and to make it our business, the way of walking in the steps of Jesus, of speaking and echoing the voice of Jesus, and in doing the things that Jesus did. As Jesus said, even greater things than these. All it takes is the faith the size of a mustard seed. And God's power will come and enter into your life. I've seen it in my life. And I'm sure if I sat with you, you can tell of stories in your life where God's miraculous presence cast out evil, silenced evil, and brought healing and wholeness to your life. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here in the first place. May we be a church in business for the Lord downtown. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this reminder of you who have of who you have called us to be. It's a hard word and a word of indictment. Because when we look at the scope and the range of your church across the globe, your Holy Spirit is still on the move. There will always be a remnant. But Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit will not pass us by and allow us to reclaim, to be filled with the Spirit and to reclaim 
the authoritative word of truth that brings both victory and transformation, that makes a difference in the world, that is relevant not because it's a voice among other voices, but that is relevant because it astounds, it attracts people to you, and it brings people to you. May we remember who we are to silence evil, to cast it out, to speak in the name of Jesus, and to bring healing in not only in, in lives of others, but in the communities and in our own community that needs so much help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to this time of invitation, uh, we, um, I, I want, you can come forward. Pastor Bryce and I will be here to pray with you if you need to make a decision. But for many of you who have already made a decision, I want you to reflect during this time. I know you'll be singing. But I want you to reflect on a time in your life when the gospel used to astound you. When was it? And who brought the gospel into your life that astounded you so much that you're walking with Jesus? And what, is, what, what do you need to bring? What power do you need to bring to bear in your life? Where you work, where you move and have your being, how you pray in order to bring that kind of awe and power into your prayer life. That Jesus may make a difference in your life. This is your time to heed the invitation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for healing us, for restoring us, for calling us to be your people. We thank you for this church, for its mission here in downtown, for being in business for you. And I pray, Lord, that we would never take that for granted, but we would continually seek to not only remember it, but to explore it and, and be our very best in being your people here in this place. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the tithes and offerings that you continue to bless us with. Thank you for these. And we give you thanks. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Several announcements. First, we want to invite you back today, of course, at 1145. You can go to the back parking lot around the corner on 15th. We'll have a drive through party celebration <coughs> for uh, Ronnie as we celebrate his retirement. And we also want to thank Becky for her ministry as well. So, uh, you know, they'll still be around, but we need to, you know, make sure that we celebrate his long tenure of being our facilities manager and indeed a minister on this campus 
for his entire life. You know, he was uh, born into this church, and it says, I think he had a room upstairs, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but he's done so much. He's always been present. He'll come at the oddest times, and, and he's always been a present. We need to thank him, so remember that. Also, uh, Wednesday, we want to remind you of our Bible study and dinner. The details are in your, uh, in your bulletin. Anything else, guys? Oh, yeah, so thank you. That's right. Come, please uh, let the office know so we can order the right amount of food. Just burgers. So I'd love to have you next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. That's right. Sunday at 4 o'clock, our men's uh, cook-off. We're going to just meet outside so you can bring your lawn chair. But we do need that. We would like a, a, some kind of count as to how many people will be there at 4 o'clock. So make sure you call or just talk to Bryce. Or during the week, just mention. If you forget to call, come anyway. I'm sure we'll have, we'll have extras. Um, Anything else? Okay. Yeah, oh, we need blankets. We need uh, blankets for the clothes closet. So if you have clean blankets, you know, that, that aren't too well used, uh, or blankets that you want to donate, please be sure to bring them uh, to the church office. We do need blankets for the clothes closet. Thank you, Christy. Uh, especially in this uh, kind of cold, wet weather. I know it's not getting cold, but blankets go a long way, and we'll, we'll collect them anyway. So uh, please bring blankets uh, for the clothes closet. With that, as you go out today, remember that your words carry power, the power to build up and encourage, to share good news, to be good news, to share healing, a healing word. And your words have power to destroy and dismantle, to tear down. So as you're looking on the footprints in the sand, choose wisely. Amen. Eternal, the King.